Hi, my name is Hiram, and Pastor Ryan invited me to be here this morning. Some people get confused because we look alike, but we actually aren't related. I came a long way to be here this morning. I'm from the town of Caesarea, and I'm from the first century. Today I'd like to tell you a story. There's nothing quite like getting something back that you have lost. You see, I have two sons. Eliezer's my oldest son. He's a very good boy. And my youngest son, his name's Joseph, but he likes to go by Joey. I don't call him Joey, but seems like everybody else does. I still insist on calling him Joseph. But there's nothing quite like losing your son. One time I remember when Joseph was a little kid, eight years old, I think. We were in Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, and he wandered off, and it seemed like it took us the whole day to find him. And as a parent, you wonder, you know, what, what happens to your kids when they're, when they're lost? Fortunately, that time we found him. You know, by the way, my sons are four years apart. They're uh, very different one to the next. They say many parents have a difficult child and an easy one. Joseph was always a strong-willed kid. Um, on the spectrum of things, he was very disagreeable, where Eliezer was more agreeable. Eliezer was my easy son. He was one that I'll just about always asked him to do. Whatever I asked him to do, he did it. Um, I didn't have to argue with him. I didn't have to fight with him. Um, Joseph, on the other hand, it seemed like the older he got, more and more things would be a struggle. More and more things would just turn into a fight. School, for instance. School, you go to school till you're 13 normally. He got some D's, a few F's even, and no matter, I mean, I tried to bribe him to get better grades, didn't seem to work. Threatened him, gave punishments, didn't, didn't seem to work either. Eliezer, on the other hand, things just seemed to come easy for him. He got, he got almost all A's. Um, Joseph, you know, when he got a little bit older, you know, he was trying to look cool, although I think he looked ridiculous at times. He walked around with his robe hanging open. Who does that? He uh, liked the pants that don't fit. He, uh, even though I told, you know, I offered to give him, buy him a belt. You know, he always, you know, kind of wore them down to here. He liked to put his hat on backwards. He liked to dress like a rap guy. Although, after a lot of fighting, he uh, didn't wear those kind of clothes at work. It's just not practical when you're out working the fields. Have, having those kind of pants on, I mean, sometimes you have to run after a sheep. I might not have mentioned, we have a family business. We're farmers. We grow wheat, we grow barley, and we raise some sheep. And my family has a tradition. Um, when I turned, when I became an adult, that'd be... 13 years old, after my bar mitzvah, and my brothers as well, 
My dad wanted to keep us in the family business. So when we became an adult at 13, he made us full partners of the business. And it worked. We stayed in it, and I loved my job and my business and what I do. And I was hoping that my sons would stick with it. So Eliezer, you know, by that age, he seemed to really, at a young age, know what he was doing and had a good, strong work ethic. He did what needs to be done. He seemed to genuinely, genuinely care about the business. He worked hard and gave it his best. So when he turned 13, I made him a partner. And I made it all legal. I had uh, Jerusalem Title Company transfer him, transfer to him his share of acreage that he would have gotten when I passed on anyway. But now it's his, and we share the profits at the end of the year. And then uh, Joseph, or Joey as they call him, you know, I was. I had second thoughts about making him a partner at that age. He just didn't seem as ready. But my wife convinced me, you know, this is a family tradition. You did it for one. How could you not do it to the other? So I figured he'd grow out of it. I figured his work ethic would improve. You know, a lot of, a lot of teenagers go through those phases, don't they? And are difficult, but um, I again went to Jerusalem Title Company, deeded his portion of land over to him. Big mistake. It went okay for a few years, and by okay, I mean I I'd found him drunk on the job a few times. I'd found him gambling when he should have been working with some of the other ranch hands. Again, I thought he, he would grow out of it. I thought that dividing up the profits at the end of the year might give him some motivation to work harder, to apply himself, to learn the business. But I was blindsided. One. One day he came to me, he had been about 17 years old then, and he said, Dad, I've had it with this farming. I've decided I'm going to sell my share, and I'm going to take a gap year or a few and go find myself. So I wanna, I'm going to put my acreage up for sale, and I'd like my buyout of the family business. That devastated me. It was embarrassing. It was humiliating. And um, I didn't want to lose part of our ancestral land. So it took almost everything I had, but I bought him out for market value of what he could have sold for it. I took a big hit, and it wasn't easy. Our neighbors knew about it. I, I felt like a laughing stock there. I don't, I don't know where we went wrong. We raised him going to synagogue every Saturday. We tried to give him plenty of love and attention, but uh, he, he wanted out. And after he had that money, he left town. I don't even know exactly where he went. He was going to go out into the Gentile world and have some fun. Now, let me tell you about the Greco-Roman world. They're, they have very different values than the Jewish world. Their morals are very loose. In fact, the United States of America is a much more conservative society than the Greco-Roman world. I mean, imagine it would be like in your day and age if your kid went off to Las Vegas and you never heard from them again. Now, 
It wasn't like your world. He couldn't call home. No phones. But I can only imagine the trouble he might have gotten himself in. He, for a few years, had been hanging with the wrong crowd. And in your, in your day and age, if I was to convert the currency, I, he made off with about $250,000. Now, when you're 17 years old, that seems like a whole lot of money, like you could live on it forever. And that seems to be what he thought. Well, he went out and uh, did exactly what I thought he would do, squandered it. He was a prodigal. Now, prodigal, that, uh, I heard my neighbor say, your son's a prodigal. I went up and looked up the definition. I always thought a prodigal was, you know, somebody that went astray, morally speaking. But that's not what the word means. People, people say it, I have a prodigal son, but in fact, prodigal means somebody that's spending money like it's going to expire. Somebody that's just spending recklessly. So my reckless son, Joseph, well, he went out and he partied and he gambled and he bought drinks for his friend and anybody else who was in the bar. He, uh, well, the money was there. I, I found all this out later. While the money was flowing, he always had a blonde on one arm and a brunette on the other. Oh, it sounds like at first he had a really good time living out there in the sinful world. But one thing that he didn't count on, that I just knew what would happen, is one day he ran out of money. One day all the money was gone. That's inevitable, but at that age, you can't see it. You know, I, I hadn't heard from him in a couple of years. I really began to wonder, lay awake at night wondering, if I was ever going to see my son again. You know, when you don't hear from your children, you worry that the worst has happened. Maybe he was kidnapped. Maybe he was locked in the trunk of a chariot somewhere. Maybe, maybe he's lying beaten in a drainage ditch. Maybe he's no longer alive. I prayed to God that he would come home. I prayed to God that he would come to his senses. After a few years of hearing nothing, no word at all, I, reality been, began to seep in that he might have died. Or maybe I'll never know. That's the worst thing, just not knowing. Maybe he'll never come back. Well, one day it was a day just like any other. Eliezer and I are out working. And I see somebody coming in the distance. And I wonder, I wonder who it is. I wasn't expecting anybody that day. But as he gets closer, I recognize my son has returned. And I start jumping up and down. And I run out and I hug him. I, I barely recognize him. He looks like things have been pretty rough for him. But I say to him, son, welcome home. I've prayed for your return. Let's celebrate tonight. But Eliezer, I mean, he didn't, he didn't run out to see him with me. He'd been avoiding him. He, he didn't seem to want anything to do with his brothers. And as, as I told the servants to prepare 
prepare a feast, go out and kill the fatted calf and cook it, invite all of our friends? Well, Eliezer refused to come in. I went out to have a word with him. Boy, did he look angry. I said to him, what's wrong? And he said, you never had a party for me. I've been with you, but when this son of yours who insulted you like that, humiliated you, brought shame to our family, comes back, you're going to celebrate him? I just don't understand. I said, son, my, my son was lost, but now he's found. He's come home. Won't you celebrate with me? But he wouldn't. Eliezer just wouldn't. I mean, some, some weeks have gone by since then, and he just hasn't seemed to soften toward his brother. I don't know if he'll ever forgive him. I don't know. I don't know if it's something that he can work through. But I'll tell you this, he's not a parent yet. Maybe when he becomes a parent, he'll understand the father's heart. Maybe one day he'll learn that, you know, it's not about him. I told him everything I have is yours. Now you get it all. That doesn't, that doesn't change anything. But my son's home safe and sound and I don't have to worry about him anymore. And he is part of our family. And now I hope and pray that one day Eliezer will come around. You know, this is, I realize something too as a father, is this is exactly how God feels when one of his own go astray. Happy to have them back, excited, Yet, well, fellow believers don't always see it that way. We don't always see it as the Father sees it, do we? Tells us, reminds us of a deep spiritual truth. Well, I have to get back to the first century now. I had to get back to work. I got to check on my sons, but what do you know, uh, Joseph? Joseph's working a lot harder and taking his job a whole lot more seriously these days. So I guess I don't have to rush back so fast after all, but I do need to get going. It's been nice being here and meeting you all. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed our guest speaker this morning. It was uh, it was hard getting them here. I had I had to bend over backwards to uh, get somebody to come all that way, both from a long way off. He's from Caesarea, and from another time. But Jesus had told this story in Luke chapter 15. I'd like to read the text today. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Jesus had just told the story about lost sheep that we talked about last week, as well as a lost coin, with the theme of it being lost and found. And then the third part that he gives is this parable of the lost son. It's been popularly known as, properly called, the parable of the prodigal son. But I find that to be a misnomer. It's in fact the parable of the angry brother. Jesus started off these parables of lost and found in verse 1 saying now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered this man welcomes sinners and eats with them 
So Jesus is reaching out to these prodigals that have gotten away. The Pharisees were offended by Jesus' association, that he would even sit with them, that he would eat with them. So he's telling these stories to convict the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He tells them about the lost sheep and the lost coin, and then this parable of the angry older brother. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were this angry older brother, and this parable was directed at them. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Could you imagine what that'd be like for your kids to say to you, I want my inheritance now? In a way, it's like saying, you know, I'm waiting around for you to die. So, you know, it's not, it's not happening fast enough, so give it to me now. I don't think too many parents would do that. Um, I think Hiram had a good explanation of um, having it be a family business and having already deeded it over to them so that a sale could have been forced, but the text didn't exactly explain what had happened or the legalities of that or why the father may have allowed him to do that. Whether I imagine it'd be rather insulting and devastating to have to have that demanded of you. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Going outside of the Jewish world into the Gentile world um, brought a lot of temptations that weren't there inside of the Jewish world. That he squandered his wealth in wild living. And we can only imagine what that may have looked like. We know what people do nowadays that go off and party, falling into various forms of vices. And one thing that I'm sure he had to learn that people learn, hey, if you're if you're throwing the parties and paying for everything, well, all of a sudden you have a lot of insta friends. All of a sudden when when the drinks are flowing, people are around. But when it runs out, where did they all go? After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him in his field to feed the pigs. Now, if Jewish people, if you know uh, the kosher laws, the Levitical laws, they weren't allowed to eat pork. Pigs were unclean animals. A lot of the time they didn't even want to be around pigs. Pigs can be very dirty. So it seems like a, a bad twist of fate to have to have a job being a Jewish boy taking care of the pigs. Be uh, something that's rather insulting. Something that he probably took out of great desperation. As there's a famine there, all his money is gone, and he had to find a way to eat. It says, verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but nobody gave him anything. Now, um, I grew up in a town that was Petal Petaluma, and the town was changing quite a bit. It had been when I was young and prior to when I was born, the butter and egg capital of the world. Producing eggs, they still have a butter and egg day parade. But the town was growing and 
it was turning into a lot of commuters were living there that worked in San Francisco with it being about an hour drive away. Yet, so there were a lot of suburbs springing up and new construction that was going on, but there were still a whole lot of farmers around. So we had friends that had farms and um, some good friends of the family and I'd, I'd stay out at their farm often as I was friends with their sons, but feeding the pigs was memorable. All of the dairy milk and products that would expire and all the old food scraps that they wouldn't eat were kind of thrown into buckets. So you have all the food scraped off the plates into congealed rancid milk um, in these buckets and you, you go and feed them to the pigs and the pigs would get excited and come running up and eat them and these buckets were full of maggots and it was rather sickening just to pour these buckets out but the pigs were just lapping it up and it was just quite quite disgusting He verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Can you imagine? When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Hey, it seems that this is finally reality. Seems like this kid is finally living in reality. That I could go and just ask my father if I could work as a hired servant. He doesn't even need to treat me like a son anymore because I've squandered all my rights of sonship. But he, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. You know, people that study the first century said that usually most people didn't eat meat day in and day out. Meat would be saved for special occasions, banquets, weddings, and holidays. And usually they ate a much more simple, mostly vegetarian diet. So... He made this a very special occasion, killing the fattened calf and serving it to the guests. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Verse 29, but he answered, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Well, you have to wonder, did he ever ask? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe, maybe his dad took that for granted. Maybe he never knew he wanted that. Anyway, we don't know. But he says, you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... Yeah, you're laughing. When this son of yours... Not my brother, not your other son, this son of yours. This is something sometimes parents say to each other when they're mad. Look what this son of yours did. Or this daughter of yours. When this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes. Well, that's the only clue is what we have to what kind of wild living he was spending his money on with prostitutes and who knows what else comes home you kill the fattened calf for him 
Older brother is offended. Older brother can't forgive. Older brother can't understand. And we have this a lot with sibling relationships. A lot of the time, there's one sibling that just has a harder time with life than the rest of them. One that just doesn't seem to have a good track record of making responsible decisions. One who can't just quite seem to get it as together as the rest of them, be it as it may. And what does that look like? We don't know. In a lot of families, it's, well, one of them's been divorced and remarried a whole lot of time. One of them can't handle money responsibly. One of them has been caught up in vices of one sort or another. One, one has a drinking problem or a drug addiction. And the others just can't always seem to understand it. You know, we were raised in the same house. We had the same parents. We went to the same schools. So what's their excuse? Right? So, and sometimes we just can't always get past that. And we have a way of looking at other people, too, that fall into different things. We, we assign blame to people that have been caught up in addictions. I just want to say, you know, that's their own poor choices. But there are things we don't know. We take a step, and, a step back and see that something like 80% of addicts and alcoholics have grown up with severe trauma in their lives. Stuff that maybe they've never even talked about or shared with anybody. And they're trying to medicate themselves and their feelings. Or money problems, relationship problems. We have a way of saying everybody should just pick themselves up by the bootstraps and get their act together. Not always so simple, but back to the Father's perspective, verse 31 in Jesus' story. My son, the Father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now is found. Man, Jesus could have explained this to the Pharisees and teachers of the law who were criticizing him for eating with tax collectors and sinners, teaching them, spending time with them, reminding them on other occasions when they criticized him that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, for they're already in the kingdom, but to call the unrighteous. So this story has a few facets to it. One, the prodigal son. And this message is often preached, hey, if you've gotten away from the Lord in one way or another, come home to him. The father's waiting with his arms wide open for you. And that's what you hear preached most of the time. And that's true. That's true to the story, true to the heart of God. But... And Jesus is telling it. This was a rebuke to the older angry brother. And so it needs to challenge some of our assumptions and prejudices that of how we approach lost people, people that have gotten far away from God, the people that are people that God loves, people whom Christ People created in the image of God, with whom Christ has died for, that doesn't yet know him, that's not yet in the fold, that we have a heart for them, to love them, to bring them back to the Lord, to point the way. Do they always want it? No, not everybody is like the son who returned. This is a story of rock bottom. I mean, that's... That's pretty rock bottom for a Jewish boy to be starving, feeding pigs. Yet, 
Some people, that's what it takes. Some people can't seem to learn on their own. Some people can't just seem to get it. Some people need to hit rock bottom before they learn, my way is not working. Maybe it's time to try it God's way. And for those of us that have been with the Lord, been with the Father, not wandered off, not made the bad decisions, we can have the joy that God the Father has in welcoming them back and celebrating them, including them, or we can be the angry older brother. Be jealous, not welcome them, not make it easy for them. That's the choice that we have. But it's very clear which, which choice Jesus is urging us to make. That we be joyful, the joyful brother, not the angry one. Powerful, powerful parable we have here today. Jesus did such a better job of sharing stories than he did just stating the plain truth. That we have to do the work at it to really understand it. And today I'd like to make a motion that we change the title from the prodigal son to the angry brother. Do I have a second? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. So moved. Parable of the angry brother. Well, amen. Now, as, as we close, if you've gotten away from the Lord and want to come back into the fold or you'd like prayer for anything else, I'm going to be up here. Don't be shy. Come forward and pray with me if you feel led to do so as we have our closing song. And then we'll have announcements and be dismissed.